Okay, so I'm Brian Cardell from Egalia. We've been talking in our past chats about the topic of browser diversity and ecosystem health. And last time I was here with Jeremy Keith and Stuart Langridge. And today uh, I have two other guests. Want to introduce yourselves? Sure. So I'm Rick Byers. I'm the director of engineering for the Blink team uh, at Google. And for the purposes of this conversation, really, I'm wearing a different hat. As many people on the Chrome team, I'm someone who just cares a lot about the open web and uh, wants to see the open web succeed. And so it's kind of that intersection of what makes sense for Google, kind of from a business perspective, and then what is good for society and the web as a whole. Where That's where I try to focus. And I am Rosan Atanasov. I am with Microsoft. I work on the Microsoft Edge browser. I was previously part of all the way back to Trident days of IE, then on to Edge HTML and Edge. And most recently, I was part of the transition to Chromium. And similar to Rick, today I am um, wearing a different hat, mostly, again, as a citizen of the web community and the community that really cares about the open web, pushes the open web forward. I'm also part of the W3C tag where I serve with a very, very similar role, which is about individual points and, and care for the web from a technical guidance point of view. And so most of my opinions today are going to be personal and I will make sure to color when uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the company. Maybe it's worth also saying, you know, of course, my, my opinions also are my own and don't rep necessarily represent those of Google. Um, but I think it's worth acknowledging that this is kind of an emotionally charged topic for a lot of folks. And it's, so it's kind of feels a little risky to talk about. But I think, you know, Ross, and from the conversations we've had, I think you'd probably agree that this is too important of a topic for us, for those of us who are kind of deeply involved to just be afraid to talk about it. And so I just want to apologize if I say anything that anyone finds insulting, you know, please let me know. Uh, my intention is, is obviously r rational people might disagree on some of the, these topics, um, but I think it behooves us all to kind of talk openly and with humility and try to understand each other. I think that's well said. So the, the topic, just to introduce really, I, I wrote this post that was talking about how we frequently talk about browser diversity, really rendering engine diversity and the importance of it. And it's usually in the context of when something has changed in that area. What I argue is that that is a useful thing to some extent, but it's also like an incomplete picture. And it's actually potentially actively misleading if it's the only thing that you're looking at and thinking about, that there's a lot of things that go into what makes for a healthy web and a healthy ecosystem. And that Really, the second half of the web became a lot more open and a lot more diversely invested in, and that that increase is actually really healthy for the commons. Both of you I know have listened to the last one, so I would like to give both of you the opportunity to say anything you would like to say about any of that? Sure. So maybe, I mean, there's all sorts of areas we could dive into here, uh, but maybe I'll just start with my guiding philosophy. You know, for this and in other areas, I believe that the most good in the world tends to come from capitalizing on win-win situations. We have a natural human tendency to look at trade-offs. We're kind of hardwired for us versus them thinking and the tendency to let it kind of mask the opportunities from win-win situations when in reality, a lot of progress and a lot of things are not a zero-sum game, uh, but it's easy to get caught up in the emotion of feeling like, you know, if something is good for someone else, you know, that for a different group, maybe then it's bad for my group. And so I've spent a lot of my career trying to find places where people might think that, oh, you know, we're competitors or, you know, uh, you know, our, we're, our interests are at odds uh, and trying to look for the overlap where there's common interest. I think there's actually, this is one of the beautiful things about the web for me is that there's a heck of a lot of, as you say, commons, a heck of a lot of common interest uh, from the entire industry. And just because something is good for Google doesn't mean it's bad for Microsoft or bad for Mozilla or something like that. And so I, I spend my time trying to find the things that are good for the industry as a whole, good for society as a whole, and also good for Google's business. I'm somewhat like-minded with Rick here. I definitely sympathize with the win-win situation and philosophy. 
you know, one one of the things that oftentimes goes unsaid, especially, you know, in a group of, of folks like us who've been working for the last, I don't know, what, a decade, maybe more together, um, sort of pushing the web forward, caring about the web. One of the things that, that goes often unsaid is that uh, there's a lot of collaboration that goes behind the scenes and into into forging what the web is today. There, there's a lot of work that goes in standard bodies around the around the industry, regardless if it's W3C or TC39 or or what have you. And there are a lot of different opinions. There are a lot of different interests on the table. But at the end of the day, what we care about the most is the better outcome for the web uh, and ultimately for uh, everybody's users and the users of the web. So when we often talk about engine diversity, I want to also separate a little bit the difference between engine diversity and browser diversity. I think there is a very healthy diversity of browsers, even if the diversity of engines is not as uh, rich as, as it used to be. Uh, I think you've mentioned already uh, some of the past sort of popular engines that were out there, including Presto and Trident and Edge HTML, which is now being uh, replaced by, by Chromium and Blink. Um, but the browsers are a lot more than that. And so I want to make sure if we're talking about browser diversity or engine diversity in this case. Yeah, well, this this is sort of the point of my article is that there are lots of layers of to this problem and rendering engines is only one of them. So for example, Brave uh, is Chromium based, but it, it is quite different in a lot of ways. That's a particular kind of interest that is at the browser level, not at the rendering engine level. Uh, first of all, I really appreciated uh, there's a lot of nuance here, and I love that your article and the, and the talk that you last had went into some of that nuance because I, I I'm often discouraged by the simplicity of of some of the discussions. You know, to, to I mean, it's not, it's not black and white. I think Brave is a good example, and that's not even necessarily browser versus engine, right? If you go and you look at the patches that Brave keeps, they have patches to blink, right? They have, make engine changes, and so they are able to express their opinion. Uh, they and they choose to do this in their own fork, right? There's I've talked with Brave engineers and we've talked about to what extent might it make sense for them to contribute some of their work upstream to Chromium um, because Chromium is a, a substrate that multiple browser opinions can be built on top of. So you can see this, for example, when uh, Microsoft was interested in submitting code to Chromium for the storage access API, right? There was some thought that, oh, this is going to be controversial because uh, Chrome doesn't believe in ITP as as the right solution to the privacy problem. And, and we're able to have kind of a public nuanced discussion about that and say like, yeah, we have different opinions on how best to maximize privacy while supporting the economics of the open web, but we can agree on a lot of the substrate. And I think we can agree that this API is being becoming part of the web. And so there's no reason why it shouldn't be in Chromium, you know, even though we don't know exactly how we're going to leverage that API in Chrome just yet. But Brave is another really great example where there's a different strategy where they didn't have to ask any permission from Google. Chrome was built to be open source on the Chromium project from the beginning. And if you read the Chrome comic book back from when it came out, it's precisely with the idea that we want to enable a diversity of opinions. We want to enable competition. In fact, Chrome started to try to create more competition in the browser space. We never expected that Chrome was going to be you know, as popular as it is, but we thought that by having a great browser that had the JavaScript engine that was faster than all the rest, we could kind of raise the bar for the entire industry. And that's totally what happened. Competition is great. And if people have different uh, different thoughts of how they can build a better browser, that's why Chrome is open source. We want to enable that. Plus one, you know, being on, on, on the other side of, of Chrome in terms of competition for many years, I have to say that we do push each other quite uh, a bit through various <laughs> various approaches that, that are being taken, whether it's performance, whether it's standards, compliance, security, etc. I vividly recall when when V8 was started and, and the Chrome folks started pushing Perf really, really hard. Uh, at the time, we were implementing uh, a new layout engine that was essentially built for future-proofing our investments into a lot of areas that we felt the 
uh, existing engine was lacking and, and we wanted to push the, the web forward so that we can have a platform that is a lot more friendlier to sort of the heavier demands of the richer digital publishing, such as really rich, adaptable magazine-like layouts or newspaper-like layouts. Uh, with built-in capabilities of fragmentation or, or in other words, of, of breaking content apart between different pieces. And, and we ended up as a, as a sort of consequence of this influencing the rest of the industry so that today Blink is undergoing more or less the same exercise and the new layout engine in Layout NG is now heavily influenced by, by our engine. And, you know, we are now contributing to that engine, <laughs> Um, oddly mm. enough, but it's it's fun. And, and um, at the end of the day, I believe that this is going to benefit everyone, everyone who is using the web through through the uh, through the through this rendering engine. That's a great example, Ross. And thanks. Uh, I remember some of those CSS working group meetings where people were proposing kind of you know new additions, Houdini and whatnot. And you would say, oh, yeah, that's easy for us. We could implement that easily. And our layout engineers would say, oh, this is <laughs> going to be years of work to implement this. And we were so jealous. And this is the kind of like this is a, a diversity of architectures that I think is one of the elements of diversity that's worth talking about, because it's one of the things we risk losing with a common code base. Even if we have different browsers on top, I've heard people talk about the, the risk of all if all browsers or if there's only a couple different ways of building engines, you know, if, if we make the barrier to having a different architecture of engine higher, then it might impede the, the ability to kind of innovate and explore different solution spaces there. So I don't know, do you, how do you think about that? Do you feel like, like imagine that Edge and Chrome were all, both on Chromium and, and one of us wanted to undertake a, a radical re-architecture of layout and the other one didn't, you know, how, how do you imagine that working? Do you think that would be a barrier to innovation? Perhaps where I would, essentially take this is to try and reflect on what that means for the end web developer who is going to essentially take advantage of uh, of the platform because look at the end of the day the platform that, that we build is is nothing without the innovation that happens on the web itself through you know the the skillful minds and, and hands of, of web designers and developers so to the extent where we enable creativity and, and ingenuity for the web, I think that that is essentially the the, the important uh, the pedestal that we should we should definitely keep. With efforts such as Houdini, uh, which you which you mentioned, the CSS Houdini effort, where we've been slowly marching down the path of enabling more and more capabilities in the hands of web developers through JavaScript and CSS so that they can go and extend the engine on their own. And here I'm going back to infamous uh, web manifesto that many of us were part of. Brian, one of the founding people there too. You know, if one of us wanted to take the engine and, and say, hey, you know, we're going to rewrite it in a way that is going to enable web developers to express themselves and build new types of layout, new types of experiences without having to come and beg us for, for hooks and, and, and APIs in the engine itself, then I would say if the others didn't follow, then they're probably missing out. So, but on the flip side, I can uh, also argue the point that, that I believe you're trying to make that, you know, if, if we were disagreeing, say, on, on V8 and, and something that has to go in there for the purposes of, say, WASM, at any given point, as long as we have an architecture that is built around extensibility and a layering and component model, which allows companies to further tailor the overall uh, final product, I think we're in a good spot. I think we're in a spot where the innovation is still enabled and there's enough affordances for everyone to go and build whatever they believe is best for their partners and customers and products and services and everything else that they want to make successful on the web. I think it's also worth noting that, that this question of how do you enable innovation and exploration, it's so simple to think of it as you know, while well, Google has a set of ideas and Microsoft has another set, but I'm sure it's probably the same for your team as it is for mine in that we don't always know among ourselves. It's not like, you know, it's not like I as the director of Blink 
have the answers of what the code architecture should be. And so some of this kind of competition and enabling innovation is something that is important to us even within our own team. And sometimes it's it's tough to figure out how to, to handle. One, one example that I really like is when uh, years ago, there was a group of folks in the Chromium project. Uh, there was an interest to introduce garbage collection to the C++ code base to solve some of the problems of having a garbage collected JavaScript heap where you've got manually managed memory for DOM objects. And there was a prototype built and, you know, we couldn't agree. And I was one of the people that said, you know, I think this isn't going to be worth it. It sounds cool. I hate manually managed languages. I think it's ridiculous that security critical software is being written in languages that can have uh, dangling pointers. But Nonetheless, the cost benefit trade off to me, it seemed risky, it seemed hard to do. So I probably was opposed to the oil pan project. But there was a group of folks who were passionate about it. And they went out and they worked on a branch. And they built a prototype. And they measured and they got feedback. And they listened to what were people's concerns. And I think it took, you know, we could go back and find the docs, it was probably a like six to 12 month process or something of iterating and, and working on the prototype on a branch before finally they had the data that people like me could say, Oh, you're right, I was wrong. This looks real and it looks worth it. And in particular, the performance hit is not anywhere near as bad as we thought it was going to be. In fact, it's a win in many situations. Your judgment was right. Ours was wrong. Uh, let's now make that the main line. And I can totally see, you know, that was within a single company. And I've, I would imagine to see that kind of pattern repeat regardless of you know, what company the people with different opinions work for. So part of my premise in this has been that uh, once upon a time when we had Internet Explorer, and Netscape, those were sort of evolutionary dead ends because there was no option but those architectures. So if you wanted an architecture, somebody needed to create it from the ground up. But really, since then, every successful engine has been gained through evolution. And it's interesting when you talk about the Chrome split, uh, because th that, I, that is a really interesting precedent in history that I think is relevant to another thing that I wanted to talk about, which hasn't gotten talked about a lot, which is, uh, if you recall that time in history, the web was, um, the W3C was sort of going in another direction. HTML was sort of done. When the Wetwig was created, a lot of us, including myself, saw that and thought, well, yeah, but look at who's supporting it. It's like Apple and Google and like these companies don't have a web browser, so <laughs> uh, that's gonna be really hard. But then Apple got together and created WebKit. But it was a lot of interest in WebKit at the time. That was really, really powerful. Uh, many people contributing, many organizations contributing for various reasons. Uh, I know like Adobe contributed a lot to WebKit. Google contributed to WebKit. Agalia contributes to WebKit. We had like 11% of all of the commits last year. Sony contributes to WebKit. And so that's really, really healthy. Also, it, it demonstrates that coordination between many organizations can be a really powerful tool. And that so when there become disagreements about where we want to take things, or if we feel that we can add to the diversity, the architecture doesn't match where we want to take the web, we, we can fork it. That also plays into Rick's comments earlier about downstream. Like there are a lot of downstream forks of Chromium and WebKit. Some of those wind up coming back, but we enable all these downstream things as well. But one of the questions that I have here that I think is really interesting to think about is how, like, how could we get another engine? We have a lot of others out there. They're not a browser rendering engine, but they are rendering engines of some kind. They're used for eBooks or print or something for your tablet. And some of those are maintained by really powerful companies with money even. Uh, so I, I think it is very possible that we could see another um, confluence of companies that could come in and bring us more diversity um, through either contributing to an uh, existing engine or forking and creating their own. What, what do you all think? The most likely way that we're going to have another engine, in my opinion, is if the current maintainers of Chromium do a poor job of being good open source stewards and the other contributors to Chromium decide that they could do better on their own and, you know, fork Chromium to, you know, you could imagine a soft fork that stays upstream, but maintains some patches, uh, or you could imagine a hard fork where maybe if there's enough interest from enough different companies. And th this is 
this is ultimately what keeps people in an open source project honest, right? In, in terms of, you know, it, it, there's a lot of reasons why it's in Google's business interest to be sharing the development costs in Chromium, right? I mean, first of all, it's, it's better for web developers. Google benefits when web developers have lower costs to build great experiences on the web. And it's the more compatibility there is between engines, the lower the cost of development for the web and the better it is for Google's overall business. And so Google has this business incentive. And so it's all these trade-offs that would determine what kind of happens to the future of engines. And these are business questions, right? Like, you know, it's kind of naive or silly to think that these are going to be determined by some kind of religious ideal. You know, it's going to be determined on, you know, what's best for different business models. We should uh, recognize that and try to understand what those business drivers are. You don't need some artificial uh, incentive. Ross and I have talked openly about this, right? That at some point it might make business sense for Google and Microsoft to go their separate ways, right? And I don't think that's something that needs to be a, a taboo topic or a, you know, oh, we hate you now kind of thing. Oh, absolutely. I mean, forking is always an option for anyone, right? I can I can see Google going into a non-compete and, you know, essentially saying, you know, from from tomorrow, we're, we're going to stop contributing to Chromium upstream. And essentially, we have our own private fork now. We can do the same thing. Uh, Bigali can do the same thing. You, you, you guys can fork Chromium tomorrow. And as far as I understand, you have enough engineering systems and infrastructure to support your own builds and test infrastructure and everything that takes to, you know, make engineering of such a, a product a reality. But I wanted to unpack a couple of things here um, because I really like this topic of, hey, what about, you know, writing a new engine and starting from scratch and, you know, redoing everything from the get-go. I've been part of essentially two rewrites of core parts of the engine from from scratch. We wrote a layout engine for IE8, and then we did it again with IE9 uh, and the new, what we call the layout builder engine. What I would say about rewrites and starting from scratch is that it is very, very difficult to write something from scratch if you come to it without any prior knowledge, without any prior uh, experience. Um, for example, building the, the first engine took us essentially three, almost three times longer then we rewrote the engine for the second time. And the second rewrite was completely different. It was completely different architecture. It was built in a different language uh, with completely different constraints, with different memory model. It was Everything was completely different. And it took us a third, maybe even a quarter of the time to do it because we were already warmed up to, uh, to everything in, in the web and, and what the expectations are for, from such a layout engine. Starting from scratch, even if you have solid, capable engineers building that muscle, building that uh, knowledge and sort of expectation of what the web needs in order to continue, continue functioning is very difficult. And Brian pointed out, you know, some proprietary engines with some specific intent uh, and purpose, such as EPUB readers or engines that are used for print. And a lot of times... These engines, I would argue that they don't need the full capability of the web. They are not as dynamic. They don't, they don't require the performance characteristics that, for example, you know, a heavy web app such as, let's say, Facebook or Twitter or something that is really, really rich requires today. Uh, their models are are a lot more about the web of what it used to be, which was a lot more static. It has to be beautiful, so it has to have enough constructs to to make uh, the designs and and the ideas of designers possible. But they are less demanding. For those specific engines, I would I would argue that you know evolving evolving their their market and their needs as a separate engine is certainly possible without without having to keep up with everything new and, and latest that we are adding into into the web platform today. I was gonna say a couple of things about forking. Like I said in the beginning, it's always an option. It's not necessarily the best one. A lot of forking can be avoided or in some cases aided through careful layering and componentization and uh, abstractions. I think the Chromium project 
is fairly advanced in the way that is being structured and different components are isolated. Having worked on it for almost two years now, I have to say that uh, the engineers who have contributed to this project have done a great job of enabling this. Um, And then there's the other part, which is governance. Currently, Chromium is still a single governance project governed by Google. And I'm curious to hear from Rick to put you on the spot a little bit on whether or not this is something that you consider important? And if so, is this something that you are considering to open up a little more and and add more governance or more structured governments into this project? So that's definitely a good topic. Um, You know, obviously it is a controversial one and not one that I am in a position to speak on behalf of Google around. But I will say from my personal perspective, one thing that is first, this is what I was alluding to before, and that I think governance in some sense is secondary to the, to what extent are uh, people's business goals being met in collaboration. And so one of those things is to what extent is Google getting value out of the contributions of others? And I know when, uh, when we left WebKit, we were the majority contributor uh, to WebCore, but uh, definitely we're in a minority position in terms of the agency we had. And so, you know, at the moment, Google is still by far the majority investor in Chromium, but I personally would love to see that change. I would love to see, you know, Microsoft, you know, Microsoft is definitely doing more and more. Agalia is doing more and more. You know, I'd love to see more and more companies hiring Agalia, helping share the load of the maintenance burden of keeping keeping things running and dealing with the bugs. And, and all that sort of thing. And I think, you know, my personal opinion is that agencies should follow investment level. And at the moment, given like it's something like 90% of the commits in Chromium are from Google employees, I don't think the current model is necessarily wrong or broken. Um, it's not quite fair to say that it is governed entirely by Google, right? It's a complicated model. There are owner's files and owners can approve a set of changes on their own. And there's quite a large number of, of non-Google owners across the product, uh, including uh, in the rendering engine with folks from Agalia and Microsoft able to make decisions about landing patches without anyone from Google having to weigh in. We also have the API owners model for deciding what APIs are shipped in Chromium. And at the moment, there are two uh, non-Google API owners. There's someone formerly from Opera and someone from Agalia. And that's also something I would imagine the owner's model is intended, both code owners in the platform pieces of Chromium and the API owner's models are intended to be meritocracies, right? As people demonstrate, they can uphold the values of the project. There's a process for adding people that is independent of what company they're from. We have examples of people who were owners in the code base and then moved companies and they're still owners. And so it is true that at the end of the day, the escalation process uh, in the Chromium project does eventually escalate up to the edge review owners if decisions can't be agreed at lower levels. Uh, and the edge review owners today are all Googlers. But as far as I know, that escalation process has never been used. You know, it might be a fun test to try someday. But generally, we found the owners in an area are able to come to consensus among themselves. Or maybe not a fun thing to test. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> And, well, and so, yeah, not? <laughs> you know, every time we see each other at TPAC or at BlinkOn or something, you know, I'm always asking Agalia folks and Microsoft folks how they feel working in Chromium is going, you know, or and in other channels, of course, too. You know, are there, are there places, sources of tension? Are there, uh, in my experience, good governance isn't a solution for uh, bad coordination and, and miscommunication. And so, like, I think all options for the future are on the table, but, um, you know, I can't say... I, I think it's more nuanced than like what you're um, implying, Rawson. What do you think? It sounds reasonable. I can hardly argue with anything that you've said. I do feel like the meritocracy that is around owners and API owners is really well put. I think there's definitely parts of the Chromium project that are really, really well positioned for multi-governance and there are parts of the project that are less so especially when it gets closer and closer to the ui layers and the and the things that make the the browser a browser which is something that we talked about earlier you know we i i I would say that we tend to agree and collaborate and work really 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 well on the web platform and less so in the parts of the product that become differentiators to different companies 
early on when I was part of the team that essentially bootstrapped and, and started the uh, transition from Edge HTML to Chromium uh, here at Microsoft, I had a, a guiding principle, which is that, you know, we want to, we want to collaborate horizontally and compete vertically, meaning that we want to contribute everywhere there is a horizontal avenue for improving the web, improving the infrastructure, improving the actual services, and then compete on the verticals of what makes a browser, on all of the user experiences, on all of the proprietary or product-specific decisions that are being made for the purposes of both differentiation and also uh, further improvements on behalf of users, whether it is tracking protection or changes to the UI layer that require deeper uh, investment. So um, much of the discussion so far before this show has been about diversity of opinion, really, which is like, how much is it possible to influence things, which is, I, I suppose, ties in actually with your governance question as well, Rosin. Uh, I know on Twitter and in social media, this is portrayed very frequently as very one dimensional. And there aren't like the, there's a lot of speculation about what goes into the politics and business of things that is not always like grounded in reality. Like a lot of things are not as controversial as you imagine that they are. They're more very practical business reasons frequently. Like we can't do X because we're already doing Y and that's necessary to do that first, or we just can't spare the cycles or whatever. So I just wondering, like, do you have any thoughts on that? I guess for me, really, this feels like diversity of opinion, which I was unable to bring out in the last show. I, I made a comment about it, but it it wasn't easily understood. And so we just moved on. Like there are places where Apple does disagree for business reasons or just for, you know, architecture reasons or whatever. Like they disagree on how something should be on the web because of privacy or whatever. That's a good thing, right? <laughs> to have some of that. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think diversity of opinion is something we need to be uh, encouraging, you know, regardless. And again, this is kind of independent from the companies that are contributing, right? The story I told earlier about oil pan, I think is a good example where uh, Google employees disagreed and it was useful to have a mechanism to enable that disagreement to gather data and, you know, ideally get to the point where, you know, the market can decide or, or, or some other more objective way, right? We, and I think tech is generally like this. We try to not make decisions based on politics, right? We try to keep the politics to a minimum and try to really focus on the merits and the data and be scientific. And so I, I think you're right that what people assume, people often assume there's like these master plans and that, you know, companies have these, you know, very top-down structured master plan and, you know, all the secret negotiation and stuff like that. The reality is much more banal than that, right? We're a collection of individuals. We all have our own opinions. We have some kind of loose organization to help us, uh, you know, get some alignment and focus. Uh, and then we just iterate and iterate and iterate. You know, we might have different principles. And this is where I think it can be useful to, to discuss these principles that guide our decision making. For example, in the privacy front, right? I think we all share the principle that we want to uh, reduce tracking online. Google has an additional principle of wanting to support commerce online. We want the web to be a great place to make money. And, you know, we know we've seen it in the data we've talked, we've shared publicly the data that shows that publishers lose half their, half their revenue when you take away third party cookies. And we think that's bad for the health of the open web. And so we have a different opinion on that from Apple and, and that influences how we're approaching and trying to solve the privacy problem. But I think it's great that there are these, that there's an outlet for these diversity of opinions and, you know, in some sense, it's the value of the free market and the value of a democracy to let people vote with their feet, let them choose what browser they want to use. I think that's a powerful choice, right? If you are not happy with the choices that Chrome has made on Android, you're free to install Brave, right? You're free to install Firefox, completely different engine. Rossin, did you have any thoughts? I do, yes. So diversity is arguably one of the things that is keeping the web healthy and continuing to keep the web healthy. But there are a number of examples that, like running examples that I can use to sort of illustrate how 
diverse op opinions continue to work today. There, there is a little bit of loss again when when people talk about diversity. They, they, they very quickly and you know run to the conclusion. Oh, you know, we don't have X number of um, engines that are written from scratch, and that's why there's no diversity. Well, reality is uh, quite a bit more nuanced than this, um, and that's to say that regardless of how you know different companies are organizationally structured and how decision making happens. And, and, and that varies vastly between companies. When we go and, and, and at the end of the day, try to move the web forward, kind of like Rick mentioned, we get together in various formats, whether this is through standard groups or online forums or sometimes, you know, uh, on on face-to-face -face meetings, the lack of diversity in these conversation is is anything but. There's a lot of work and a lot of hard discussions that go behind features of the web. I'll give you one quick running example, which is five, six, maybe seven years at this point, we, um, as part of rewriting our uh, layout engine, we wanted to bring more and more fundamentals to layout to the web. And one of the features that we brought up was CSS Grid. And at the time, uh, we were quick to implement it. It was rather straightforward in our engine. And when we when we brought it to to the web, there was a lot of excitement, but also there was a lot of pushback on various technical aspect, aspects. And I'm not going to go into the details of what uh, followed next, but there were a lot of back and forths between all of the different stakeholders and... At the end of the day, again, it took someone like Rachel Andrew to go and continue advocating for Grid and for the richness that it brings to the web and then joined by Jen Simmons and, and more advocates um, from the design community. And last but not least, certainly not least, Igalia stepping in and, and driving implementation into WebKit and, and Blink, fast followed by Gecko. And... Talk about diversity, right? Talk about diversity of opinions. Like we have argued endlessly in the CSS working group of how grid should work. After that, we continued to argue as various people were landing their work in different engines. And it wasn't the engines and the fact that they were different that made this particular feature as successful as it as it is it was those conversations it was those people who are truly passionate about moving the web forward uh, and yes they represent different companies these different companies have business goals and a lot of times people will channel and have to channel business goals in conversations but it was this community, it was this diverse set of people and opinions and desires and, and passions for the web that, that, that are bringing these, these types of features um, to the web. I think, I think that's a really good point. And this, this is something I was a little disappointed that you didn't touch on more in, in your last talk, Brian. Is, uh, there was some conversation, I forget who said it, but you know, a question of, oh, well, what can we do about this? You know, how can we support diversity? You know, and... You know, there's a few obvious examples that or answers that weren't touched on, I think, which is, um, you know, first of all, people can get involved in the standards process. People can get involved in these debates. We need increasingly, I think all the engines are doing a better job of listening to developers. We've got the MDN needs assessment survey that we're using to try to help prioritize things within the Chrome team. Um, but there's also room for other people to get directly involved, either in standards debates or open source projects. Or the, the one that I was, was most surprised you didn't mention is, a lot of businesses depend on the web. Maybe they don't have the skills or the context to know how to, to actually be productive in di being directly involved, but they could hire a Gallia, right? They could say, oh, my business would be served by this. You know, maybe there's probably 30 different businesses out there that would be in their interest to get together, pool their money, right? To this question of the war chest you talked about last time. Yeah, okay, you know, our, Google has a bunch of cash in the bank, but our resources for investing in the web are not at all limitless, right? We, it's actually fairly finite where the resources between all of the different companies in the world that benefit from the web are massively greater. And if even a fraction of that was going towards uh, to pay for things that benefit the commons, right? Uh, if, you know, the way Grid was developed or 
um, you know, whether it's Agalia or other companies like Agalia, I think that would greatly increase the diversity, increase the diversity of investment is maybe another way of looking at this. You know, to me, it's a shame that the diversity of investment, the number of companies who are willing to actually put their money into making the web a better platform for everyone who benefits from it is quite small. And I think that's just an artifact. The barrier to entry used to be so high that only the biggest companies could be involved in the browser market. Now, um, I don't know if any of you have read uh, The Master Switch by Tim Wu. Tim Wu co coined the term net neutrality, and his book, The Master Switch, is a phenomenal history of all the different communication technologies and kind of the trade off between openness and closed. And he makes the point that the definition of openness, it's not about some of the things we've talked about here, it's about how high is the barrier to entry in the market. And open source, and, and frankly, Brian, earlier you mentioned the whole Watwig W3C history, something I think it's lost on a lot of people is at the time, W3C specs were copyright W3C, which meant you couldn't legally fork them. Watwig folks had to go and reinvent, basically write HTML from scratch. That was a huge barrier to entry, a huge uh, barrier to diversity and innovation. You know, luckily now most specs we work on uh, permit forking. Um, I think we've learned from that. And similarly, most code bases we work on now uh, for engines permit forking. And so I think that's dramatically lowered the barrier to entry to anyone that has uh, different ideas and wants to contribute or wants to try to be part of the market themselves. And I think that's the, the thing we should be most focused on. Like diversity is valuable, but we should fix the structural things that prevent there being a high barrier to entry, to a high barrier to actually applying diversity in practice. The readiness and the openness to diversity today is actually amazing. I, I think the, the 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 barrier to entry in motivating and and shaping the web and influencing the shape of the web is has never been lower. Anyone with a GitHub account can go and open issue against any spec that they don't they don't like or they find bugs. Testing is another huge part that has to be that a lot of times goes understated, like completely understated. But you know, if you find issues, if you find problems on the web, nothing stops you from going. And if you're a web developer or designer to craft a test, submit it to web platform tests. And, and now, you know, with that new test, you will force people who are failing it to go and fix their engines. I think that is a huge part, again, of, of diversity, of diverse, diversity of opinions, diversity of experiences that people have. And collectively, the sort of power and the reach that people can have today through those open forums to go and, and influence. So I think, again, today we are way better positioned than even just like some two, three years ago. Yeah. I mean, when this came up in the previous chat, I mentioned that this might require context that I hadn't realized of some of my other blog posts. But this is the argument that I started making uh, sort of late last year is that this openness really matters and that a lot of these things that we think about as being these hardline opinions that are like non-productive sorts of diversity that just prevent us from getting things done that are, are not that there there are definitely each of these organizations has some they have hard held opinions but most things are not this and what it comes down to is like you said these mundane, banal things that are more about business, which is obviously from a galley standpoint, I'm very keen to talk about because I think that what we do is really, really healthy for the ecosystem and that it's only possible because of this increased openness, because we have made things more accessible to anybody who wants to contribute and that what we're building here is a commons and we're currently a little bit suffering from a tragedy of the commons, maybe for not the greatest reasons. <laughs> like the investment is incredibly geared toward a very few companies. And the rest of us have the economic power to do way more <laughs> than those couple of companies even could. So we should exercise that power. Here, here, De there's definitely a tragedy of the commons in terms of like how we're advancing the web platform. You know, it's, it's something, it is this commons that benefits a lot of businesses, but the the investment is very lopsided uh, relative to the return on investment that society and businesses get.
Agreed. Plus one. <laughs> Maybe I should also add, you know, it might come off as a little bit whiny here. Like, oh, poor Google, poor Microsoft, you know, they, you know, they, they, they want other people to help foot the bill. I say this more, like, I think it's important to, you know, Google obviously has a responsibility here. And I'm not looking at all to shirk that responsibility. It's more just, I think it's in the, in the interest of society if the investment was, was more balanced. It should be diversified, yeah, right? Absolutely. Like, yeah, yeah, no, that, that's my point. I mean, my point is, you know, I'm not, I'm not crying a river for any of you, uh, especially Google. I mean, Google spends a, you know, near infinite amount of money on, on investing and I'm so happy that they do like I'm, uh, but I think the world would be better if we diversified that because, um, you know, there's there's only so much at the agreement level of words that can be done at the end of the day. There's like real work that needs to be done. And if you leave that into the hands of a very few companies to prioritize the work, that will impact what we can get and when we can get it and what we can get done in ways that are unnecessary. Going back to this question, I, I think we didn't get into it in detail about what happens if somebody wants to contribute something to Chromium that Google isn't interested in. I think that's a really good question. And you know, back to my point earlier, no one should expect Google to operate as a charity or as some kind of like you know nonprofit. Google operates in its business interest as a business, and you know you should just understand what those interests are. But there are plenty of examples where where priorities differ, right? Where so I, I think a great example for us to bring up is MathML. And I, maybe you did mention this, Brian, in your last chat, but you know, to me, what happened with MathML was Agalia and some other groups cared a lot about MathML and the Chrome team mostly as a whole felt like the value of MathML relative to the cost and the complexity it would bring to the code base wasn't worth it. And so we weren't willing to make that investment, but rather than say, you know, no, we don't think it's a good idea. We were careful to craft a like, yes, if message to say, you know, as the, as the owners in the code base, we supported contributions that met the following criteria. And one of them was like the code base, the code's got to be maintainable. It's got to be, you know, we have the spaghetti code of a layout system. And so we're doing this massive investment to re-architect the layout system. And so if MathML can be built in a way that's modular, then that dramatically reduces the costs and the concerns around maintenance burden. And then secondly, there was the question of, can we actually make something that's interoperable here? At the time, the MathML spec was very hand wavy. You know, the test suite was not very rigorous. And so we just pointed at the guidelines we already had for what bar do we apply when deciding whether something is mature enough to ship. And frankly, we were worried that Agalia was underestimating how much work it was going to take to get some subset of MathML to the place that it actually met that bar. And we, we were worried that people would have you know, some different expectations that you know, maybe if they could do a little bit of work, they could get to that bar and they would be disappointed when it came to an intent to ship. And so we tried to spell it very clearly where we saw the risks with trying to meet that high bar that we have for interoperability. And... Now the consensus is pretty clear that Agalia really stepped up, right? We were clear on what it would take to ship uh, MathML, and Agalia did the hard, thankless work with Google employees reviewing many of the, the CLs, but Ag Agalia did a lot of work to meet that bar. And I think, you know, I think the jury is still out on, well, I, don't, I don't know what the current timeframes are looking like, but I fully expect MathML to ship at some point, and it'll ship in Chrome at the same time, even though from Google's business perspective, it probably wouldn't have been a good return on investment for us to do it. But I'm thrilled that a guy was able to do it, even though our judgment would have been not worth it. Yeah, I'm I'm thrilled too. Um, so a couple of quick notes on that. So it is shaping up really nice. I'll share some of that stuff pretty soon. And also worth noting, our tag review completed today, which is great. I'm looking forward to it. Look, I, I'm a huge supporter of having a, a native math into into the engines MathML and having the ability to at the end of the day increase the EDU market which will benefit the most out of it especially you know having been through one full semester of having a middle school student at home and having her do all of her work through online tools having better EDU support will go a long way. So thank you on behalf of all of the students, future students that will benefit from it. Our explainer and our opening for TAG, we argued that this is uh, really toward the TAG's ethical web principles, that this is a good for society. It will help in precisely the thing that the web really originally wanted to help with.
So I, I think it's invaluable to be able to share math for education or say coronavirus research, right? Yeah. Um, these things are really good for society but not necessarily in anybody's first business interest. I think this is exactly where the diversity of ideas and priorities uh, comes in, right? It may just be that we were wrong at Google to say that it wasn't worth the investment. And so it's great that there can be these different opinions and we don't have to try to all agree. You know, there's some places where at some point there are aspects of Chrome, the product, the product, we do have to agree, but then there's a separate question of, what do we need to agree about in the code base? And and so I think this is a great example where, you know, I, it'll probably remains to be seen. I'm optimistic. I'm excited about what you guys are talking about. And it sounds great. I'm looking forward to seeing, seeing that value uh, materialize. And it's great that we didn't have to try to get agreement on that point a priori. Yeah, I'm really happy about it. Um, does anybody else have any other things? That, I feel like there's more you could say on web platform tests and um, like even that it's only possible to have this level of interoperability and everything that it also like really raises the barrier toward the likelihood of getting a new engine that like you it is very interoperable and there's so much of it now sure I, I liked in your last chat you were talking about this idea of raising the level of collaboration at what level are we collaborating and the framework around that and i think it's absolutely true we've gone through this massive transformation i think probably most people who use the web don't realize it. it used to be that the test suite for every engine was completely separate and yes there was some effort to have some shared tests but it wasn't really real it wasn't used in the engine development process in a serious way and now i would say we've really crossed the threshold where the majority of browser engine work happening today is happening with a completely shared test suite or a, a very much shared test suite. Certainly anything that's exposed to developers is now just part of our culture that when you do web platform work, you do test work and that test work is shared between the engines. And this was kind of a, a slow transition behind the scenes, but it was very much an intentional transition to raise that level of collaboration that you were talking about because it's in none of our interests to have there be diversity of behavior of APIs, right? I mean, and there's special cases where you might want to apply that. You might want to say, you know, maybe exactly how request storage access behaves. Maybe we do have differences of opinion of how that behaves, but the default should be that behavior is consistent and we should have to make an active choice to have difference behavior instead of the de facto of what we had before was the default was you had very different behavior and you had to exercise this kind of superhuman diligence to transcribing the spec into code and comparing precise behavior details of browsers. And in practice, we were just terrible at it. Yeah, it's a it's a little bit of a catch twenty two anyway. If you don't specify it, because you wind up with similarities, and they wind up being de facto similarities that are unwritten down, which is worse. You don't hear people lamenting the loss of diversity there. You know, oh, there used to be this, this wonderful diversity of implementation behavior. I couldn't I couldn't agree more on this one. I mean, having having gone again through a number of rewrites, man, if we had the amount of tests public that were contributed and, and are available today, oh my goodness, it would have been so easy to stand up a new engine and, and validate that chances are when you release it, you're not going to break a whole bunch of things. And having that test suite, having people being able to contribute to it freely is absolutely one of the major reasons why the, the web is as interoperable that it is today. And to Rick's point, no one is, you know, arguing about, oh my goodness, there was, you know, this browser used to render borders that way and that browser that way. And, you know, I liked one border versus the other border more. And I missed that. Like no one is saying that. I remember more often than not looking at four different implementations when I was trying to stand up something and trying to pick which behavior to switch because none of them were following the, the spec and sometimes specs are not very clear. And so, oh my goodness, yeah. Having having the the public test suite and having having so many tests contributed is absolutely a must. I, I know Jeremy had mentioned this thing about like monoculture with regard to like crops and just having diversity just because there is diversity is good because you don't know what you don't know. And I wonder if even in terms of this, are there any examples where maybe we have benefited from something like that? Like was Borderbox that, Rawson? Having an implementation that worked differently 
than other implementations? Didn't didn't Border Box come from like IE the way that IE yeah. did it? Yeah, and it was argued by most developers and designers that setting, for example, the constraints on the border box, which is what you see, makes the most sense. Yet the standard model was the opposite, which was setting the constraint on the insides of the of the of the box. And so as a result of this, the box sizing property was was brought on to the standard so that we can we can have the switch between the two. Didn't IE actually implement it differently to, to begin with? Yes. And then and then everybody was like I like the way I did it. Yeah, <laughs> that, I, that's my recollection but it could be wrong. I, I think if I'm not if I'm remembering correctly, I think you're right. Uh, it was like I said, it was a quirk that was carried forward all the way through probably i7 and then in i8 we adopted the standards behavior and we also implemented the switch between the two so that for people who liked it and still this is one of the quite used properties out there today. Um, oddly enough, it simply makes sense visually, so people prefer it. There are a number of, of examples where there were differences of implementations, and over time, those that are so much remarkably better than the others prevail, and, and, and others tend to, tend to follow with their implementation anyway. I think we just tightened the loop today, the feedback loop. Like, I don't think it like unless somehow we wouldn't discover that benefit because it was like some weird vestigial appendage that was waiting for somebody to find a way to capitalize on it. I think we just find it really quickly today, right? Like uh, Resize Observer is an example of something that we came up with really, really quickly. We implemented, we spec'd, we tested it and like it was actually shipping. And then as somebody else came along to implement it, they asked, different questions and then as we got to use it like real users started to use it because it was becoming like it was gaining critical mass maybe now is the time to start paying attention to it we found other problems and then we said oh well you know the way that the way that this browser does it, it makes more sense than the way that that browser does it. but we did it very very quickly like it was very expedited and i think that that is like the right balance of those things like we get the diversity but we're able to also then sift it down very quickly and come to agreements and gain standards level interoperability. Yeah, definitely. Agreed. I, I was going to mention the example of pointer events that uh, when Apple first added touch support to a browser, they had this model where the API could cause scrolling to block. And when Microsoft introduced pointer events in the IE 10, I think it was, they rejected that model and had a different design philosophy of saying, whether or not something scrolls should be declarative, not an imperative thing that you block on script on. And I think that was absolutely the right design choice. And it's interesting to imagine what would have happened in an alternate world, you know, a world where maybe we were using the same engine. It was a multi-year journey to get to the point where now we have pointer event support in all browsers. And critically, we have this, this touch action CSS property that lets you specify the scrolling behavior declaratively. And, you know, it, it's complicated. I don't think it's, there are cases where I think the there's going to be a trade-off involved and it's not always going to be, you know, I, I would hate for anyone to come out of this thinking that I'm arguing that there should just be one engine. It's complicated and nuanced and, you know, it's not even as simple as counting like that, as we mentioned the example of Brave, but I am confident that this isn't a decision that one of us should be making. This is an ecosystem. And I really like the analogy to crop biodiversity. There is something about resilience comes from diversity. And so we, we want to create an ecosystem that is both uh, highly diverse, but also, you know, adaptable and effective at solving the problem. You know, we don't want diversity. There's good diversity and bad diversity, right? Diversity that just decreases the effectiveness of the solution, right? Whether it's organisms, right? Having a whole lot of organisms that are not as effective at survival is not something that, you know, would be selected for in a, in, in crops. So we, so, you know, there, it's, it's a complex dynamic system. And I think the best we can do is make sure that we're setting up the conditions such that it can evolve and the system can adapt and best, you know, be best suited to meet the needs of its constituents. Yeah, absolutely. Rossin, any closing thoughts? Yeah, I would also agree that engine diversity doesn't necessarily equate into diversity of opinions, diversity of what is best for the web and what is worse for the web. The ability to continue evolving 
the web through open forums, standards, uh, open discussions, agreements, and disagreements is, in my opinion, what continues and should continue to push the web forward. I, I value that type of diversity a lot. We touched upon a little bit uh, earlier in our discussion about the f- part of forking and multiple, multiple examples of forking. Forking is always on the table for any company. And if there are times where that makes the most sense from either business or other points of view, I can see any company walking away with their fork and continuing to invest into to that con- particular branch and would that be better for the web or not is to be seen. There have been forks that have been very, very, very ineffective. Just the fact that they're yet another engine doesn't mean that they're bringing anything better to the web. At the same time, I would strongly encourage and hope that people will go and try new engines and try to bring completely new points of view to the web. That would be fantastic to see. That's well said. Awesome. All right. I guess we're about out of time. So I just wanted to thank both of you for joining me. And if you have any final thoughts. I I just wanted to say that one thing I'd encourage people to take away from this is this is an important conversation and we can do better than just having flame wars on Twitter. You know, I think I encourage folks to get to know the people you're talking with as people, um, try to be respectful and constructive and assume good intent. I know this is hard to do. We're hardwired for for all sorts of things that work against this goal. And so maybe, you know, maybe Twitter isn't always the best forum for some of these discussions. So thank you, Brian, for for having the for supporting this uh, additional forum. I think we're going to need a lot of additional forums. You know, we need to remember that we have a lot more in common and a lot more common interests than we have differences for all of us that benefit from the web and contribute to the web. And so I just want to encourage folks to try to put the majority of your energy into capitalizing on those common interests that we share. And then, you know, that is what helps build trust and a spirit of collaboration and respect for each other. And, uh, and then on top of that gives us a good, a great foundation to debate openly and honestly about the places where we disagree and do that in a way that it's, you know, can ultimately help us all get better and correct our mistakes, our mistakes and our biases over time, rather than just dividing us and pitting us against each other. Yeah. I also wanted to, Thank you, Brian, for allowing this additional forum. Getting into the echo chambers of Twitter and just repeating the same over and over is not going to probably help things in the long run. Repeating what you believe is wrong, what you believe is wrong, and just continuing to echo your frustration is always going to be less effective than... Uh, if you go and try to do something about it. As we've already talked about, there are many, many, many different ways of being part of the solution rather than just, if you believe there is a problem, of course, to being part of the solution rather than just continuing to point fingers and and, and get into uh, flame wars. Add your opinion to specifications, add your opinion to bugs, add your opinion to um, various places where technical uh, or strategic discussions take place, add tests. If you're an engineer, add patches, land work, fix things, be part of the solution, be part of what continues to propel us forward. You know, we, unless this is not clear, uh, coming clearly, I'm going to spell it and say that we love the web. Like I love the web. I want the web to win. I, I am, I've been pulling for, for this platform for most of my professional career. and. I love it when I see people who are part of the solution. I love when people point what is wrong and and try to help us get to a better place for all of us. So I would strongly encourage you to please, please be part of the solution uh, and help us get to a better place. Awesome. Thanks, both of you.